Did you ever encounter the game so beautiful, so exciting, so interesting that you suddenly get obsessed with its lore? If you go to Altjof's rig in God of War Ragnarok, you can find the scroll titled Passion. I found this lore piece quite odd because it talks about alienation of worker. Why and how did entry into Marxist theory end up in a AAA title? As a side question, what exactly is wrong with me? As all gamers know, lore is meant to be collected for a completionist achievement. It is not actually meant to be read. But well, let's return to our favorite alcoholic, Karl Marx. Lore scroll reads, <clears throat> It is incredible what they take from you. I used to love mining, reaching into the hardened earth and pulling out its fruit. I take a bounty home and make it into something beautiful, something that was mine. Now I do it for you, for a seer. Now I do it because you'll beat me if I don't. The beatings I can handle, flash heals. But you took my passion. Every day I wake up and I dread doing the very thing that once gave me purpose. And this is the best voice acting you ever gonna get from me. Dwarves in God of War are subject to colonization by a seer who impose militarized and industrial practices over the whole dwarf realm. Dwarves in God of War, like developers in video game industry and most people working in real life, got their craft replaced with industrial production. The problem is, God of War is not a good fit for a video about alienation. And I will now quickly spoil half the game for you, so Click on this timestamp if you want to avoid spoilers for Ragnarok. So, three, two, one. In Ragnarok, the two most prominent dwarves that play a key part in the story are not actually alienated from their labor. More accurately, they are a pair of expats living in a mansion secluded from all the troubles of their world. Closer to the peak of the story, Brock accidentally dies, sacrificing himself for a higher cause. Sindri is then never able to reconcile with his loss and becomes bitter and resentful. Sindri later disappears, leaving a woman to pick up a slack and look over his house. Classic move. Top scholars of Reddit still argue about what awaits Sindri in the next games. And I don't want to sound like I don't like the story, I actually loved it. After all, God of War takes pride in good writing and complicated character development. Not all stories have to end well. So, since God of War did not build on topic of alienation beyond one single lore piece and overall pitiful state of Svalfenheim, I did put topic of work and games at the back of my brain, where it stayed till about now when I started to get through my ever-piling video game backlog. This year I only played three games, Undertale, Returnal and Elden Ring that will probably take me 300 hours to complete because of my obsession with item description. Why is there a soap? I still don't know. Why is that a usable item? I don't know. But I sure know that it's made of mushrooms and it does indeed remove grime. This severe gaming accident may be contributing to the fact that this video release is delayed and the overall fact that my video game backlog only became more bloated since I started, you know, getting through it. Please somebody help me. So let's return to work. Master Hugh is everyone's beloved personalized craft station, a sweetheart, cursed omen, and a slave. Oh wait, let me change for this occasion. Here, now I look like I know what I'm doing. Also don't judge my build, because I'm in the player base that is barely good enough to play this game. Master Hugh is located in the same hallway as Roderica. Their position in the history and social structure of the lands between is entirely opposite. A cursed, disfigured, crucible slave and young, pretty, noble woman. As I was going around and playing and making questionable choices along the way, the memories of God of War came back to me. Roderica is here because she found her calling in constantly upgrading my mimic ashes because I got no friends to play with and have to hang out with a copy of myself. But all in all, as a character, she is free to do and go wherever she pleases. Yet she sits here because she found a sense of belonging and self-realization in her work. Master Hugh, on the other hand, is a slave, working endlessly on the never-ending task assigned to him. While his position does not alienate him from work as a blacksmith, as it was with Swalfenheim dwarves in the Passion Scroll in God of War, 
Nonetheless, Master Hu ought to do his work no matter of his wishes or desires. His work takes over his whole character. He is nothing but a blacksmith at the service of the tarnished. Work is a rather complicated theme to discuss when it comes to video games. All the way from the origins of cinema and literature, we encounter a story of a regular working guy. There are whole subgenres of animation and movies that are dedicated to discussion of real working life in both tragic and comedic settings. But when it comes to games, the topic of work seems to fall flat and is rarely explored. After all, we all work every single day. It is quite difficult to get excited about spending a weekend or additional lifetime hours doing the same thing that you already do for work. There are, nonetheless, many interesting attempts to reflect on the sad reality of work in late-stage capitalism in video games. Diaries of the Spaceport Janitor is a game that you never heard about. It is an anti-adventure game. It is set on a space station in a cyber future. You, the main character, are a janitor. Your job is to go around the space station, collect trash, and get paid in municipal credits for your work. Other characters in the game will treat you with pity if you're lucky, or with outright disgust. Vendors in the game sell a variety of weapons, devices, and magical items, none of which you can afford by any stretch, or know how to use for that matter. Like this high pleasure chip that you can get if you collect enough money, but oh well, you don't have a necessary bioport to use it anyway. Relatable. Most of the days, actually all of the days, your hero will collect trash and fight for pennies. Main and only questline, lifting a curse and escaping the space station, is almost impossible to complete. Some on Steam forums think that level of difficulty is irritating, or that this is simply a bug in a game, but I believe that this level of impossibility to complete the main questline is an intended part of overall miserable world setup. Escaping poverty in real life is almost impossible. It makes total sense that Spaceport Janitor can never complete his quest and leave the port either. Janitor protagonist gets harassed by police, has to eat trash off the street, and relies on lottery tickets, prayers, and bank loans to maintain survival. You can, however, abolish gender. Therefore, 10 out of 10. Diaries of the Spaceport Janitor captures the concept of working poverty pretty well. While your character spends all day working, they can barely afford food, and even that comes under question on some of the days. All of these limitations are fairly common in real life, too. The only exception is that Spaceport Janitor, at least, has their own closet and bed, while many working poor in real life reside on the streets, in cars, and on the sublease property of their employers. This is, however, a niche video game, and I would not recommend it unless you feel like throwing out 10 bucks on the game about collecting trash. In which case, go for it. Some mainstream games will allow you to pretend to be a worker as part of your adventure. Control will allow you to get a janitor uniform as a reward for a questline progression. Red Dead Redemption 2 will send you doing farm duties at a miserable pay, which is quite an interesting way to immerse you into the state of boredom of the main character, who is now doing farm work instead of being a Wild West bandit. Overall, though, despite most adults spending majority of their conscious hours working, single-player games rarely explore the topic of work itself. There is, though, one very notable exception among working-class protagonists, which we simply cannot ignore. The face of one of the most famous Nintendo franchises, and perhaps all gaming, Mario, was a plumber. A rare and early example of a hero that actually has a job. There is some confusion as to why Mario was assigned to be a plumber. Either it was because of the use of the pipes in level design in first games, or simply because Nintendo wanted to make hero more appealing to regular Americans. Maybe Mario was indeed intended as an average working-class Indian-American man on a quest to um, save a princess from an anthropomorphic turtle that lives in the castle located in the sewage system? Of course, there is no game where Mario did any actual plumbing, and Mario's link to plumbing was removed by Nintendo from his official character description. 
In one sweep move, Nintendo removed working class reference from what could be the most prominent working class character in the video game industry. All that is left of Mario's working class background is his overall cargo pants. There is also an interesting case of Assassin's Creed Syndicate. It even allows you to interact with Karl Marx himself. The problem is, you still play as an elite assassin isolated from working class itself. And I guess we have to interrupt our adventure here to talk about Karl Marx for a second. There is probably Marx on the thumbnail of this video, he is probably in the title too, and he definitely is on the cover of the main source material for this video, Marx at the Arcade by Jamie Woodcock. Here is his little face. While I do think that Karl's choice of hairstyle is quite charming, and that discussing labor without discussing Marx is like avoiding Jomengander in the room, I also have some objections to his ideas, which will not be discussed in this video. But I will talk a lot about labor rights and the video game industry, so a ghost of Marx in today's video is unavoidable. But let's go back to the Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Even worse than the deattached position of the main protagonist, Syndicate is just not a good game. Controls and gameplay did not age very well, and it was not the best game to begin with. Though Assassin's Creed series never were shy on asking players to eat the rich, I can give them that. Maybe that's why the kids are so woke these days, those French video game developers with their pesky ideas of decent standard of living for working class. Either or, working class struggle is a hard topic to outline through either main or side characters. It is not that Brock and Sindri come short of exploring the topic of worker exploitation that is so prominent in their own home realm in God of War. It is more that the topic of worker exploitation is not very appealing to the development of the story. Unless, of course, it is someone else who has to do the work, and not our main protagonist. Games propose a whole range of NPCs that do nothing but service the main character. Day and night, Skyrim craftsmen, innkeepers, and traders await the adventurer who can, finally, put a bucket on their head, pickpocket their clothing, and trade in their overweighted inventory. Once games became complex enough to have characters, we just started to assume that there should be NPC merchants as a currency exchange stations, which is a natural expectation of the players that play games now. In games that portray any sort of social setting, we expect to see craftsmen, bankers, and even purely environmental NPCs going about their workday. And gamers surely love to use NPCs for their experiments in unethical labor practices, or other tests, like how many NPCs can be dispatched before the game becomes completely unplayable. Unlike the main protagonists, NPCs and strangers can be subject to all sorts of miseries in video games, including doing the actual work. In some rather unique cases, games present us with a whole collection of labor exploitation practices. Frostpunk is a great example. Police state, religious authoritarianism, enforced labor – everything goes when you need to keep up your generator running during the eternal winter. You can call Frostpunk an anti-adventure game, just as Spaceport Janitor Diaries. But instead of forcing the protagonist to eat rotten brains found on the street to avoid starvation, Frostpunk forces players to develop their colony through a combination of class war, terror, propaganda, religion, drugs, and other means of manipulation that are definitely not employed by your state apparatus in real life. I think, at least in part, Frostpunk rose to its level of popularity because 11-bit studio used already popular genres of survival and building with a relatively uncommon topic of unethical industrial practices. There is only that much fun you can have building some green and boring suburban sim city, but there is an endless source of entertainment in sending children into coal mines. Just ask any colonial trade company. The topic of worker exploitation strikes into the hearts of many modern workers. Many gamers, and well, developers too, experience unethical industrial practices towards themselves in real life, and can use games to reprocess their own experiences at work. Most games use a worker abuse as an environmental setting. On the surface level, this is why Marx's theory is written into the lore scroll tossed into the random corner of Svalfenheim. 
The Warps, colonized by Sierra, too scared to fight for their independence, participate in Ragnarok, or even leave their own homes. It is a setting in which Ragnarok happens in God of War. Worker abuse highlights that Odin is a villain and that he needs to be stopped. It sets the tone and it sets the stakes for the player, but it doesn't really go any further than that. This would be a fine conclusion to this video, if I was not obsessed about the single piece of the lore for over 12 months. So let's talk about the real deal. Let's talk about the real hardworking man taking on real jobs in the video game world. Let's talk about dead games. In the making of this video, I unconsciously cornered myself into talking about video game genre that I don't really play and don't really like. But anyway, Power Wash Simulator. I'm watching you! <laughs> Power Wash Simulator has 35,000 overwhelmingly positive reviews and 10 out of 10 rating on Steam. Take that, Kratos! Indeed, maybe God of War would not be so emotionally damaging if instead of dragging his son across nine realms, Kratos would just engage in normal dead activities such as lawn trimming, pressure washing, grilling, or renovating campers. Some of the simulator's arcades and puzzles make up what is described as hyper-casual gaming scene, games that are designed for absolute non-gamers. Hyper-casual games are fastest growing gaming audience as well as one with excellent profits. Do you want to make a living as an independent game developer? Consider abandoning your artistic desires and instead creating a smooth phone puzzle with loads of absolutely horrendous ads. Traditional gamers often do not even consider this sort of games to be video games at all. Let me remind you of that amazing moment in 2018 when Blizzard rolled into E3 with their phone Diablo. Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do a uh, PC. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones. Yeah. But well, despite denial from mainstream gamers, Candy Crush and Power Wash Simulator are indeed games. Video game simulators are still, though, very confusing. Just why? Why would you simulate work? Seriously, long haul driving, power washing, renovations, and lawn trimming are jobs. They are fairly boring often physically demanding jobs that people do in real life. For work. For money. Why would you want to pretend to be at work while sitting at home? This is unintentionally a perfect setup for a classic wife bad joke. But instead of poorly made misogynistic joke, I'm gonna read you a definition. A definition that distinguishes games from work. There is quite a bit of overlap between games and work which is also proven by shitty gamification garbage that your corporate office comes up with to make your miserable workday just so much more fun, in their opinion. Roger Kalios of University of Illinois highlights several criteria that make game a game. First, playing is a free choice. Games are separate from other parts of life. Play is intended to have no fixed result. Take that, speedrunners. Gaming is also not a productive activity. Game has rules. Game is different from real life. Woodcock in his book suggests running this definition through the Marxist theory. So separate becomes separate from the tools of labor not owned by the worker, which fair to say sounds like a stretch to me. And not productive becomes not productive according to capitalism which I think is a fair interpretation. But seriously, there are actually interesting simulators. You can build a farm or a city, or you can fly around the world, or you can become a goat. But there are also simulators which are just boring. Why would you spend hours trimming an unreal lawn? Various types of simulator games either exclude negative aspects of simulated game or turn them into challenges. Simulators turn mentally and physically difficult tasks into experiences with points and sound effects. Almost as if the work can be an enjoyable and fulfilling experience if taken outside of the capitalist model of labor. Lovely! Clean the window! Look at all that bird shit! 
oh well. But anyway, simulators of course also remove difficult and unpleasant components of work. Truck driving, for example, is extremely hard on the body and is often a source of mental illness in drivers. Not that it is talked about in male-dominated and traditionally manly job. In a simulator game, however, risks to health are eliminated, while nicer parts of the job are enhanced, like endless beautiful scenery of a road. In a simulator, player becomes a worker in the same playful way as kids become a nurse or a fighter when they're playing. It is not work, but you are pretending to be a worker in a more interesting and fulfilling atmosphere. I personally find simulator games quite boring. But what I do find interesting is that a lot of simulators create skill trees for the jobs which are in real life targeted as unskilled, accidentally highlighting the absurdity of unskilled labor term. Simulators usually abstain from the topic of worker rights and worker exploitation. It is a sterilized version of work. But the absence of labor issues in simulators speaks volume. It appears that there is plenty of fun at the intersection between work and play. But real jobs fail to utilize positive aspects of work. Instead, they try to compensate for the alienation of workers with pizza parties and worthless currency systems. Speaking of the intersection between work and play, there is actually more than one reason to put marks into video games and into video game industry. Currently, video games are an entertainment industry worth billions and predicted to grow even further. Younger generations now abandon all forms of entertainment in the interest of a more interactive media. Video games, for the large part, are owned and produced by ultra-wealthy corporations, where the creative urge of developers is ground, reprocessed and refined into a final product of a video game. As profits drive video game industry into the future, more and more video game developers are facing abuse and alienation in game development industry. Currently, video game industry has been actively reframing game development from an artistic craft to industrial production, where a worker is reduced to repetitive tasks, work is de-skilled and automated. While video games have become more advanced and thus are able to picture more interesting and complex narratives, not much has changed on the back end of game development since the early days of the industry. If you start researching the first video games and early video game history, most of the materials will eventually link you to the game called Space War, developed at MIT in 1962. Space War is played by two shooting spaceships that move around the star on a radar-like screen. But this is not really true. Electronic versions of games like tic-tac-toe, chess and checkers were developed between 1940s and 1960s. Starting the history of video games from Space War by MIT student creates a myth in which video games are exciting and fun projects created by students at the time of forum in computer lab. This mythology, though, hides a real but more dim history of early video game development, the shady legacy that affects how and why workers are exploited in the industry today. The first modern video games were developed under close supervision of science military complex that was booming on the, on the fertile grounds of US federal funding at the times of the Cold War. Hatspiel 1955 was a tactical simulator game that simulated nuclear conflict between USSR and the US. In the 60s, stage or a simulation of total atomic global exchange followed the suit. Experiments in video game development were encouraged by both US military and US government, and nuclear theme continued to roll for decades. If you are in your 40s and 30s, you will remember the series of command and control games. Those are excellent games of their time that once again allowed us to explore the ever-exciting topic of nuclear annihilation. Games like Tennis for Two, Neem, Space War, and even earlier Tic-Tac-Toe were not just random inventions of the bored IT students procrastinating in the MIT lab. They were results of experiments in algorithms and early AI development held by professors and students who were actively involved in Cold War arms race between USSR and US. USSR, on its part, was also investing a ton of money into Cold War technology and, as a result, produced Tetris by Alexei Pajitnikov. 
since both military and IT were viewed as male-dominant fields, despite hundreds of women running the actual computers, video game development industry to this day remains an absolute sausage party. US Army realized very early on that video game audience, mostly male, was perfect marketing ground for cannon meat recruitment. Video games were and are an amazing strategy to never run out of young males to be sacrificed to the gods of capitalism in the endless imperial war. Cuddly relationship between video games and the US Army continues to this day. As a result of early video game concentration on nuclear conflict, war, shooters and fighting games, early genres of video games were limited to content sponsored by military and appealing to male-only audiences. This brings us to 80s and 90s, the boom of arcades, the early access to personal computers, and also video games that we are more familiar with today. By 90s, three things were very clear. Game development was a boys' club, gaming was a boys' club, and these clubs significantly overlapped. But not in that way, though who knows, history has many exciting twists. To this day, video games as an entertainment are involved in catering to single audience of confirming cisgender white American men. And while any game that caters to anything but the traditional player base causes some of those original guys to have meltdown all over social media. And, you know, some of these misogynists may be mad, but otherwise, how would this man discover that women have body hair if not through female protagonists in video games? The only other extended post I found about God of War and Marx was, well, on Gamergate subreddit. In one of the posts perfectly titled The Neo-Marxist Agenda of God of War, author, who is clearly neck deep into fighting woke war on Twitter, claims that God of War is, of course, woke. The author sees the issue with plot of God of War lying questioning authority of the fathery figure of Odin. I don't want to spoil it to anyone who's been avoiding God of War in fear of woke leftist agenda, but the main villain in the previous God of War series is fucking Zeus. Top comment on this, there I remind you, official gamer game subreddit reads, this is just a conspiracy fuel. But well, let's not strive too far away from our topic at hand. Rising access to personal computers and fairly standardized programming languages meant that with little patience and creativity, gamers themselves were able to make video games in their own homes. This turn of events resulted in two cornerstones of video game employment that lasted for decades and only start to get questioned now. 1. Games are made by gamers, for gamers. And 2. Making video games is not a job. It is, instead, a passion. Idea that video game development is not a real job became even more popular as in 90s and 80s, young adults questioned previous generation's idea of work. Instead of getting education, finding a stable and boring job and working there till one or more of your organs shut off, these kids wanted something different. They craved passion. Video games and personal computers allowed just that. They allowed young males to become hackers, programmers, and game developers in their own rooms. To this day, developers and even CEOs of multi-million dollar companies choose to lead their presentations in shirts and jeans. They merely continue a video game tradition of dismissing every idea that is associated with traditional employment. But even though these guys may be wearing hoodies, they aren't standing on that E3 stage for free. Since video game development was established to be a craft, that meant that any amount of work that one would put into the game was justified. Overworking on a game was not a sign of hyperactive delirium, but a sign of true passion and artistry, an exceptional commitment to one's own craft. Early game development work ethics also contributed to the formation of the Silicon Valley tech pro culture. To this day, video game development and tech industry share a mark of close origins, such as socially awkward CEOs, predominantly male workforce, lack of clear differentiation between work and life, and occasional obsession with techno-spirituality. 
Now, a sense of passion embedded into the origins of gamer culture is used as an exploitative rhetoric, which is used by major video game producers and publishers. Corporations don't want to hire employees that they will need to force to crunch. Corporations instead want to hire employees who will crunch for free on their own. Crunch is a typical practice in video game industry across the board, and it is the main pain point of the employees in the industry. A lot of the games that you love and cherish are actually a product of worker exploitation. Arguably, almost all of the games you play, even shitty ones, actually, especially shitty ones, are built on crunch. These are the games that are created on 24-7 operations, lack of sleep, poor hygiene, and unpaid labor. Is that surprising? Not really, of course. Crunch is a fairly unique scenario, not found in any other industries on the scale that it is in the video game industry. At some point. In the ancient time of barbarism, before the internet, games were sold on cartridges, discs, and CDs. That meant that the games had to be completed in time and in full before it was sent to manufacturer. No delays, no first day patching, no system adjustments. Publishers were, and till this day, are not very keen on extending timelines for game releases. As a result of a hardware limitation, developers would normally crunch in the days before game had to be sent to manufacture. Plus, you know, why won't you work for free on the game that you love? After all, it is not work, it is passion. Despite not being limited by the need to produce hard copies of the game, video game corporations continuously make developers crunch. It is both part of the workplace culture and managerial practice. Later on, corporations started to introduce pre-crunch, telling developers that they can work overtime and for free earlier to avoid working overtime and for free later. So what do you think happens when employees start to pre-crunch earlier? Nothing. They just crunch later just as much. Nothing happens. To this day, in the majority of cases, and especially in the US, crunch time is unpaid, with employees often reporting to work between 10 to 40 extra hours per week during crunch weeks. And as you can guess by the background noise, it's a time for dinner for cats. But nonetheless, let's continue. While making this video, I also discovered that California passed an exemption early in the tech industry development. They pretty much allowed tech companies to not pay overtime to tech workers, including game developers, under the premise that IT workers get paid above average. And you know, state sanctioning worker abuse because workers get paid above the poverty wage is weird. No, not unexpected. That trillion dollar industry wealth is going to trickle down anytime now, I'm certain. In some cases, crunch is also supplemented with free food, which is delivered to the offices of developers. You know, bringing that stuff pizza party energy to the whole new level, as if you can compensate for 40 hours of unpaid overtime with a soggy burrito. In even less ethical cases, corporations try to market idea of good crunch to their employees, which is a very weird way to say that your employees are still gonna be abused, but less than in their previous workplace. From early days, labor organization practices and worker rights movements often excluded video games and IT industries. Industry organized unions did not consider computer guys employed by military or corporations who were already paid pretty high at that time to be a part of working class. Developers themselves often refused the idea of unions because they refused the idea that video game development is work in general. These IT guys weren't like other girls. They were allowed to wear sweatpants to work and didn't need to organize. Project-based employment also didn't help, as traditional unions rely on bargaining power of full-time permanent employees. Lack of organization in the past now results in workers who have to individually bargain for their working hours.
due to a lack of organized action, crunch becomes a team burden, and those who are not crunching are perceived as traitors who abandon their team at the time of the hardship. Peer pressure is then commonly used by corporate managers to make sure that teams self-enforce poor working environment. In some cases, employees can develop a Stockholm Syndrome, where they treat crunch as a rite of passage or bluster about the amount of overtime that they put in, turning water cooler meetings into a dick measuring contest. Non-disclosure agreements are used to make sure that later on, development teams will not talk about crunch with journalists or each other. Due to the history of the games as an entertainment that was catering to young males and produced by young males, women were largely excluded from the formation of the industry. At the time, women were operating major section of card-based computing, but they were viewed as secretaries in service of real hacker guys. This stigma continues to carry on to this day. And don't even get me started on player-based stigma against women, because this video will turn into a two-hour video essay about Lara Croft's triangular boobs. Which is not a terrible idea, I guess, if this video somehow gets 200 likes, I'll make a video about Lara Croft's boobies. Aside from stigma at work, younger girls would also be barred from playing computer games. In part, it is because parents didn't want to expose girls to boyish games, but also because as a general practice, girls are encouraged to stop playing earlier than boys. This refers to playing in general, it is not just a video game thing, actually team sports are the worst. Women, therefore, are rarely encouraged to develop a passion for video games, a passion that is then required to enter development teams and esports. For women who have skill, passion, and desire to enter development teams, culture of crunch creates glass ceiling. Majority of women, in game development or not, are responsible for a second shift at home, with housekeeping, childcare, and cooking being woman's job. And you know, faced with a choice between 16-hour workdays or feeding their toddler, women generally prefer to compromise on their career to make sure that their offspring doesn't die. Glass ceiling largely remains in place, especially in large corporations with more brutal crunch culture. Despite the fact that overwhelming majority of surveys in the industry show that employees crave more diverse workplaces. Rockstar may put suffragette in their game and make frontier women wear pants, but they still do crunch like hell, and 83% of their workplace is male, and women at Rockstar get paid 65% less than men on average. And while Rockstar games are still one of the more decent large-scale developers out there, since most of the game developers are male and most of the senior management positions are occupied by men, that means that when conversations start to happen about workplace culture, women are excluded from the conversation and are not able to voice their concerns, thus facilitating the crunch culture. Since women are known to be less reliant in the times of crunch, managers knowingly avoid hiring women, resulting in self-perpetuating cycle of exclusion. Video game corporations form workplaces which are made of young nerd guys, packed into confined spaces for several weeks at a time, isolated from their family and friends, where they are encouraged to compromise on their own well-being and their health and social connections for the sake of corporate profits and no additional compensation. In the end, video game work culture hits pretty far from promised passion. In 2004, in the ancient archive known as Life Journal, a small essay called EA, The Human Story, by the EA spouse, went viral. And going viral in 2004 meant that pretty much everyone who had access to the internet, knew English, and used Life Journal was aware of this posting. Essay starts like this. Electronic Arts' bright and shiny new corporate trademark is Challenge Everything. Where this applies is not exactly clear. Churning out one licensed football game after another does not sound like challenging much of anything to me. It sounds like a money farm. To any electronic arts executive that happens to read this, I have a good challenge for you. How about safe and sane labor practices for the people on whose backs you walk for your millions? If I could get Electronic Arts CEO Larry Profs on the phone, there are a few things I would ask him. What is your salary? Would be merely a point of curiosity. 
The main thing I want to know is, Larry, you do realize what you are doing to your people, right? And you do realize that they are people with physical limits, emotional lives and families, right? Voices and talents and senses of humor and all that. That when you keep our husbands and wives and children in the office for 90 hours a week, sending them home exhausted and numb and frustrated with their lives, it's not just them you're hurting, but everyone around them everyone who loves them. As a result, lawsuits were filed, dues were paid, people started talking, and less popular confession by a rock star spouse went somewhat viral. But in the end, two decades later, not much has changed in video game development industry to this day. There is one more thing to be said about crunch and women. Women actually do participate in crunch. The difference is that in the best tradition of exploitation, their labor goes unpaid. Men who crunch away their health and personal lives rely on labor of other people to maintain sad lives in their absence. Like EA spouse, many women raise children and care for abused men. They carry responsibility for life maintenance, but also responsibility for rehabilitating their partner after months of endless crunch. In case of younger workers, it is not their wives, but their parents and their mothers who are responsible for making sure that beds are made and dinners are served for arrival of their sons and now, more often, daughters who have not left the office in the last week. As a result of the video game crunch, employees suffer negative health consequences. Crunch leads to stress and burnout. It leads to negative consequences to social life, too. Employees can face breakups and social isolation as a result of constant negligence towards people around them. And I know that video game development is not the hardest job in the world. It is not even the hardest job in cyber and IT industry. The whole industry relies on child and slave labor for hardware production. I work in the factory of all places. You don't need to tell me that repetitively lifting 30-pound boxes for 40 hours a week is harder than running QA tests on yet another cursed edition of EA FIFA game. But despite what video game industry workers think of themselves and what we think of them, they are workers. In the last decades, video game industry turned from weird small hobby to now billion dollar production that encompasses everything from indies with pixel art to ultra-realistic reconstruction of medieval Britain in games to iPod games for toddlers that don't even know how to walk yet. As the industry matures, jobs in video game development become compartmentalized and are actively de-skilled. They turned into little repetitive tasks to be given to lesser paid workers. IT work is increasingly automated or outsourced to workers with even less employee protections. Video game production is undergoing process of industrialization in real life right now. Like craftsmen centuries ago, video game developers today are becoming alienated from their labor. The craft of video games is already turned into large-scale industrial operations that produce 60 FPS games, polished graphics, ray tracing, realistic facial animation, yet often lack actual substance. And just like any capitalist industry does, video game industry also abuses its workers. On the player side, crunch culture results in shitty games. Games released too early in the development process or cropped for the sake of profits and release dates. Crunch results in broken games, in first-day patches heavier than a bucket of plutonium, And above all, crunch results in creative developers leaving industry forever or turning to more uninvolved positions in video game development. I think it is great that video games as a medium become more advanced. Games start to explore more complex topics, including the topics of work and worker abuse. God of War has no obligation to be that well-written and that thought-provoking. Yet it was creative choice of the developers to not only make the game with complicated characters and complex story arcs, but also to release the game that is polished to the very last piece of its writing. Don't be sorry, father. Be better. As movies, music and paintings, video games become creative medium that people can use to tell complex stories. 
stories that reflect on reality of our lives and the reality of our work. As far as worker abuse is progressing from the cradle of video game industry to today, a lot of important things have been happening. As industry changes, so does attitude of its workers. Younger generations enter the scene, and with them, culture of the industry is changing too. For younger workers, game development is still an interesting job to do, it is still a passion, but it is also now a job. Women, too, slowly take their positions in the industry, and while visible minority groups are severely underrepresented in both gameplay and in development, this gap also starts to close. Though, of course, there is like a very long way to go. But 2018 saw formation of Game Workers Unite, a worker-driven grassroots organization which is fighting for worker rights in the video game industry. Game Workers Unite, which you can read as GWU or GWU, is an unexpectedly ugly acronym to be created by a bunch of internet folk. But Game Workers Unite started to adapt existing worker defense strategies to new video game industry, as well as they started to develop new strategies that fit this technologically advanced yet creatively driven industry. The struggle within the video game industry itself, of course, is at the early stages of development, and as workers in Western countries try to unionize and organize, corporations respond with subcontracting, outsourcing, and de-skilling their jobs. This is, of course, just another reminder that worker organization works best when the industry has a sufficient level of unionization right across the board. In recent years, we saw a return of small and experimental titles, as well as bigger development studios that proudly do not crunch. Video games like Hades or Baldur's Gate are highly acclaimed in their field. One game developed by a dozen people, the other by several hundred, yet both were successfully released with excellent quality without systematic crunch. My favorite game of the last several years is Dead Cells, which I can barely remember how to play now, but it was made with no known crunch. Motion Twin also doesn't need to unionize, because it is a worker-owned and a worker-operated studio. Game developers who are lagging behind now have no choice but to step up and start proactive measures to increase the quality of life of their workers and thus try to prevent unionization. New management teams try to introduce project-based management strategies, which are used for God knows how long and how many years in any other industry. Folks, not that you don't know that by yourself, but those contractors working on delayed construction in your city, they aren't working 16-hour shifts for free. It is still obscure to me how over the years video game industry just normalized exploitation practice which is unimaginable in any other modern setting. You may ask yourself, what can be done? And you know, as 2023 is ending, a lot of us will be getting gifts of either video games or subscription or associated merch. I think it is impossible, but also sort of meaningless to try to avoid studios that engage in poor business practices. I know you aren't going to skip on those juicy 75% AAA discounts that will be dropping on the Boxing Day. But even if you decide to skip on one game, your $70 is going to have minimal effect on 37 billion bottom line of electronic arts. It is, of course, possible to support your video game developers, mainly by not harassing them online for delayed release dates, or, you know, encourage video games and developer teams that make great games without crunch by spending dollars on their products. But of course, if you're working in video game industry, organization and unionization are going very long way really fast in changing workplace environment. No amount of external support for gamers will ever come even close to worker bargaining power, which is achieved through organization. In some way, video games can be art, but they are also a collective project achieved through work of hundreds of people. As all things that combine art and work, video games should not be forced through worker abuse. Otherwise, we just end up with shitty video games. And well, nobody wants shitty video games. Thank you for watching. Subscribe so we see each other on the next one. Burn the earth tree to the ground and incinerate all that divides and distinguishes. Ah, uh, may chaos take 
the world. May chaos take the world! <laughs>